Welcome everybody. We are Unchained Disciples. We're getting into our series, Hearing from God. Hearing from God. We're on a multi-part lesson, How to Know God is Speaking. This is the sixth part of it, How to Know God is Speaking. So we're looking at how to discern if you got a word or a thought or a plan that you think is from God, how to discern, how to test it. And so I'll start asking you guys a question. I'll ask you guys a question. What if you came to my house and you looked and you saw that I had an altar, I had candles, I had an altar, and on that altar I had a picture of Donald Trump. And I told you I prayed to that thing twice a day. What would you say or think? <laughs> to each his own. I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> We're about to have an intervention. Okay. <laughs> I had to talk to you about why. Wouldn't know what to say. I would just be like, you know, Lord have mercy on him. What were you going to say, Kenneth? I would have to ask why that setup exists. Why okay. Okay. Anything, anything from the Bible you'd want to tell me? Commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. But then okay. it really doesn't matter if you're not a believer. Oh, but he didn't say whether he was a believer or not, did he say? Well, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. So, so Trump might be your God. If I had an idol here, if I had an altar to him. And you okay. said you prayed to it? Yeah, if I said I prayed to it. But then we would have to, I'd have to pull you along the side. <laughs> I would, I would hope so. I'd have to pull you along the side and, and we have to open up the book. Yeah. Yeah. I would hope so. Okay. So this is, that's obviously hypothetical, but, uh, okay. Do so what? Have a, do you have a pitcher and candles and stuff like that at your, at your place? No, I don't. I oh, don't. Okay. I don't. It, no, it. no, no, no pictures, no candles, no altars. But we are going to speak about that. We're going to speak about that. We'll get to that later. All right. But it's uh. Like a perfect Brady Bunch with this setup. When you see all the different pictures, like the the old TV Brady Bunch. Yeah. Yeah. With the show uh, where it has the pictures of the. In gallery, in gallery view. Yeah. Right. And they're like looking up and down and to the side at the other people around them. That's right. Sorry, I got to take my picture on you. Just All right. I'm ready to meet y'all. So let's. Uh, so we'll get into our lesson. Our lesson is uh, how to know God is speaking. How to know God is speaking. So we'll do a quick review. Quick review of our series so far. We looked at different ways that God speak to us. We looked at twenty different ways. I've uh, went over them quite a few times, so I'll just run through them. We said the main way that God speaks to us is through the Bible. He speaks to us through the Bible. He speaks to us through prayer. He speaks to us with it. Sometimes it could be an audible voice. He could speak to us with, through pastors or teachers. He can speak to us through a prophetic word, tongues and interpretation, dreams and visions. He can speak to us through a peace, and we're going to get into that more today. Uh, he can speak to us through unusual circumstances or coincidences. He can speak to us through a fleece, so whereas you say, if God, if this is you, do this or that. He can speak to you by opening or closing doors, opening or closing opportunities, bringing a thought to your memory, or you can have an inspired thought that you attribute to God, or it can be a prompting of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about more today. He can draw your attention to something. Uh, he can speak to you through nature, various parts of nature or through creation. He can speak to you through your emotions, through writing, inspired writing, or he can speak to you through angels. So those are the ways that we looked at that God can speak to us. We also looked at the ways that God responds to prayer. We said God can respond to prayer in five different ways. He can say yes. He can say no. He can say wait. He can give you confirmation or clarity if you're asking for confirmation or clarity or on a subject. Should I take this job? Should I marry this person? He can give you confirmation or clarity. Or he can respond to you with silence. With silence. So silence is also a way that he responds. 
So those are the five ways that he responds to us. And then we also talked about that there are, that, that there, there are, if you hear something that you think is from God, if you get a thought or an impression that you think from God, it can be something else influencing you. So it may, it may not be God. It may not be God. So we're looking at how to discern if it is God. So we looked at other things that it could be. So in addition to a, a thought coming from God, it could come from your own mind. It could come from your own mind. It could come from your flesh. It could come from your gut. It could, come, it could be the voice of the world, voice of the enemy. And then I'll speak quickly to a, a new one. It could be the voice of your religion, a voice of religion. So we talked about the voice of your mind, the voice of your mind. So it can be your own voice. So you may have had a plan. It's your own plan. It's your own opinion. You have your own plan or opinion, and, and that's influencing your thoughts. Or maybe your emotions, so how you feel. Maybe you are afraid or embarrassed or you're worried about what people think. That could influence your thoughts or a plan that you have. Or it may be your flesh influencing you. So it can be your desires. Desires, we talked about lust of the flesh, which is to desire uh, something pleasurable, a desire, physical desires, or it could be a sinful tendency, or it could be lust of the eyes, to desire material goods or status, or it could be the pride of life, where you desire power, significance, or respect. We talked about the fact that it could be your gut. So it can be, it can be your, your stomach, your intestine that's actually influencing you. So we talked about the fact that your bacteria and viruses in your stomach actually send signals to your brain. So they send cravings. Uh, they can even cause addictions. Uh, cravings for sweets, alcohol addictions, sexual desires. They influence your obesity, your, your gut, the bacteria in your stomach. And we talked about that it could be the voice of the world. The voice of the world that's influencing you, the cares of the world, Jesus said, can keep you from inheriting the kingdom of God. And so we said the voice of the world is the system that promotes non-Christian ideals. So it could be the science, it could be media, the news, it can be popular opinion. And so now that our culture used to be centered around the Bible, the majority of people used to believe the Bible, but now they believe now we, that less and less people are believing the Bible, people are hinging on to ideologies. So they're, they're, we have these ideologies that have become the new religion. People take a big group of ideas, they take a group of ideas and they just accept them as their own. So that maybe someone claims to be a Republican and they'll take all the conservative ideas or the Democrat, they'll just group the ideas all together or or maybe, you know, a feminist, so I'll take all of the feminist ideas and they'll just accept them all, accept them all as a big group. You don't have to think about them individually, you just accept them all together, even if they're contradictory with each other, or maybe envir environmentalism. You know, I looked and there's a, there's a bright green environmentalist, there's a deep green, there's a light green, and... Uh, and they just, you just follow these values, and, and the world believes, and they come to now a place where they believe, well, I'm a good person because I follow these values. I follow all of the Republican values, you know, I, I don't believe in abortion, I don't believe in this, and, you know, I voted for whoever they told me to vote for, so that makes me a good person, but whoever thinks differently is a bad person. And so you, you just, you think the morality is tied into my belief. So I have these feminist beliefs. And so since I believe all of these, I'm a good person. Whoever believes differently is a bad person. And so the, but the, the beliefs that you have, whatever the secular beliefs are, they're, they're tied to your culture. So the beliefs you have now, maybe it's uh, my beliefs on, you know, diversity, inclusion, beliefs on this, it's, it's tied to the culture. So... It fits America I believes this, but someone in Iran may not have the same belief. Or someone in China may not have the same belief because it's a different culture. Or you may have a certain set of beliefs, but even here in the same country a hundred years ago, they didn't have that belief. But yet, we think that that is self-evident. Everyone should believe this. It's self-evident, but a hundred years ago, people didn't believe it. So it's obviously not self-evident. 
and then eventually so it's based on the culture it's based on the place you are in history and it's also based on your emotion so you think oh well, that disgusts me people who would do that so it, it you know it, it's your emotion so you think it's wrong it's right or wrong for someone to do that because I don't like it and so if you're if you're in a secular belief system it's my culture I think it's right it's the historical context or it's just I don't like it so therefore it's wrong you have no other basis to base it on you know everyone if you're not a vegetarian then I can't believe you know you're harming animals you know there's no basis except for the fact that that's what you believe you know but you think someone is wrong who believes differently because because I, you know, I don't like that belief. And I saw an interesting, uh, a long time ago, an episode on uh, South Park where, where they, uh, the kids had done something in that, was, that was not tolerant. And they, oh, I think that, yeah, the town had a flag. It was an old flag and it had a picture of, of a, these stick figures or these little drawn men. So they didn't have faces or anything. And one of them was being hung it was like, looked like he was being hung, like lynched. And it was a black stick figure, and they had white stick figures, and the kids were saying, what's wrong with that flag? So they sent them to be trained for tolerance. So they sent them to the Museum of Tolerance. In the Museum of Tolerance, the lady was teaching them. She was like, look at the history, showing them, you know, the history of slavery, showing the history of everything. And she was saying that, you know, you shouldn't, you should accept everyone as they are. And, you know, you, should, you shouldn't judge people just because they believe something different than you. You know, and she was training them how to be tolerant and, and accepting of other people. And then, to, and then she went to the lobby and there was somebody smoking. And she said, get out of here. You know, that's just filthy. That's a filthy, disgusting habit. You know, get out of here. We hate smokers. And then she went back to the kids. See, you should just tolerate people who believe different than you just because they believe different. And it just kind of showed the irony of, of how it is. But it turns out the kids... When somebody pointed out, see what, you know, it's racist because of, they're hanging the black person. They're like, oh, we didn't even notice that that one was black and the other ones were white. So they didn't even notice that they're the colors of the people. So they were like, you know, far from being racist. They didn't even realize that there were colors of the people because they don't, they didn't really see color. But, um, but anyway, so yeah, so the voice of the world. Any thoughts, any thoughts or comments so far? You're probably going to answer this at the end, but so what's the, um, not solution, but what do we do in order to uh, be able to discern, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, we're getting there, so so yeah. Yeah, this is review, review of the, uh, yeah. we're, uh, we're getting there, we're getting there. And then the last voice that's not of God was the voice of the enemy. So the voice of the enemy, we talked about that there's 10 ways that the enemy tries to influence you. With strongholds, stronghold is not a sin, but it's an argument or a belief that, that makes you think it's okay to do that sin or okay not to follow in the Bible in that path. Enemy also tries to temptation influences you with temptation, influences you with fear. With fear, influences you with isolation. We talked about the fact that the enemy will attack you when you're vulnerable. And the enemy tries to attack you with condemnation. Condemnation, uh, like a condemned building, makes you feel that you're not fit to live in. The enemy will influence you with deception, make you think something is valuable that's not. He will interfere with you with distraction. And we talked about the fact that the enemy can influence your thoughts. We looked at a few biblical examples of that. And that the fact that the enemy can also use other people. So those are the ways, the voices that can interfere with you hearing from God. Those are voices that can interfere with you hearing from God that we've talked about so far. And then the last one that I'll add, hopefully quickly, this one I, I, um, I don't know came to me we've kind of alluded to it but the voice of religion the voice of religion could also because your religion your doctrine it, it could contradict the Bible potentially so if you if you so if we look at the history of the Bible or the history of Christianity or, or the people following God the Old Testament most a lot of the Old Testament is you know God rescues the people they worship God and then they turn to Baal worship. 
God punishes them. They turn back to God. And then a few kings later, they're back to, you know, they're worshiping Asherah or they're worshiping another God or they're turning away. And then we see, and that, and that just keeps repeating itself. The people, they build a golden calf. So they're worshiping other religions. But so we see that the, but they thought it was okay. So within their religion, the practices that they adopted that they thought were okay were wrong. And we see the same thing when Jesus came back with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the most religious people. They were the epitome of following the law, following the Torah, following you know, Moses' law. They were the, the keepers of the law. And they, they were the, the standard from which whether you were following it correctly or not. And Jesus came and told them, well, no, it's wrong. You're making the law of no effect. So the, that, the popular belief of the time what the religion thought was good was actually had drifted away, had drifted away from the truth that God had actually laid out. And then God would send someone, send Isaiah, send Ezekiel, send Jesus, send someone to tell them that they were wrong. You know, and, and so we see things, so your doctrine, so an example of doctrine, one of the doctrines is, is that God doesn't speak anymore. God doesn't speak to us anymore. He's given us the Bible and that is all we need. So basically, you know, God wrote a book, gave it to us and said, you know, good luck with that. And so that's that's what a lot of people believe. And so that will interfere with you hearing from God. If you don't think God still speaks, that will interfere with you hearing from God. You know, even though the New Testament is full of places where it talks about the Holy Spirit is going to tell you this, the Holy Spirit is going to guide you. So it's like, well, God obviously has to be communicating with us some way. And then so I gave that that uh, example at the beginning talking about, you know, a kind of a pretty far off example of, of somebody worshiping Trump. But what if what if they're worshiping a statue of and they said, hey, it was a huge statue and they're worshiping it. And they say, this is a statue of God. Would that be OK? No. Same thing. Right. It's the same thing. Uh -huh. God, a statue of God or a picture of God, of God. Yeah. Well, nobody knows what God looks like, so. Right. I, that's still a figure. It's a figurine. So it's not, you know. Right. Yeah. To me, it's an idol. Right. It's an idol. And so we talked about idols of people praying to Mary or saints and kind of criticized the. Uh, the Catholics, um, let's see, does anybody, has anybody heard of Warner, Warner Salmon? Warner Salmon, Warner yes. Can't say that I have. No? Okay. So the Warner Salmon, the New York Times, they said that he was the best known artist of this century. They said he's the best known artist of this century. Like the, the most known like, artist. Uh, musical arts or? No, like uh, painting. Painting, painting or just in general of any art or, or not, not musical, but yeah, art painting. So, so they said he was the most known artist of the century. So Warner Salmon in 1940, he painted a well-known picture. Uh-oh, I will leave my screen to do this. All right. I gotta find my screen. Can here. I can I read um, the verse from Leviticus nineteen four while you're looking for the screen? Yes. It's about idols. Okay. So Leviticus chapter nineteen verse four. Do not turn to idols, nor make for yourselves molded gods. I am the Lord your God. Right. So don't make any idols. And there are a lot of places where he says not to make any idols. Ah, I can't share my screen. Okay. Well, I will improvise. So Warner, Warner Solman. So Warner Solman, he, I'm sure you're familiar with his work. So in 1940, he created a painting, and the painting is called The Head of Christ. And this is that painting. Are you familiar with it? Seems like that was the only picture. Yeah, it looks like Christ. It looks 
Looks about right. <laughs> so this... As you said, as people have depicted him. So this painting sold 500 million copies. 500 million copies. Half a billion copies of that painting were sold. So what if you came to my house and I had an altar... Say that again. I think it's Lorraine's um, audio. Yeah. Oh, okay. Me? Oh, okay. All right, so what if you came to my house and instead of a statue, a picture of Trump, I had that picture on an altar? Would that be better? So this is a picture painted in 1940. This was the artist's depiction of Jesus, which wasn't the depiction of Jesus prior to that. So it's a picture that he painted in 1940. So would that be any better than having a picture of Trump? You know, that, you know, if we all, you know, pretty clear, that's probably not what, a, you know, 2,000 year ago Jewish from Palestine guy looked like. Almost every church had a <laughs> photograph, that photograph. Exactly. If there were altars, so. Their altars and not, not the Evans family on Good Times did it. They had a picture of Black Jesus. They had a Black Jesus, yes. No, yeah. So that was a different. But but the, yeah. But God, if God says, you know, it's, it's clear that was one of the distinctions of God from the other gods of the Jewish people. God, Jehovah, Yahweh made specific. He gave them specific rules so that they would be different than the other people. So they had specific diet. They had specific days, you know, they had a Sabbath. They had specific way they grew crops, so they lived different. But one of the, the signature things, the most things that made them stand apart was that they weren't allowed to have a, a, any image of their God. So all of the other religions had statues and images. So one of the things that set our God apart is that he was explicit that they were not allowed to make an image of, of God. And so if Jesus is God. That's no better. That's a man made. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, it's the same thing. You're, the concept is the same as, as having Trump, but I'd much rather see the picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trump. Yes. It's a, yeah, there's a whole lot of. There's a lot of difference, but it still it still uh, goes against. Yeah, it still goes against the uh, what God commanded. But uh, but I, I won't labor belabor that point. So so the the voice of your religion though can keep you from hearing God, and that was just kind of showing that how the popular belief can sway from what the Bible actually says. <clears throat> and so that was when we looked at. Oh, any any thoughts? Any thoughts on that? You know, you bring up a good point because, like, um, yeah, the popular belief, mm. you know, the populace, just because the populace says that it's okay doesn't necessarily mean that it's okay. Right. You know. Meaning that what's okay? But, um, yeah, we... we we can get caught up in legalistic, uh, well, anything, you know, for instance, uh, prostitution, right? In the state of California, it's not legal. You go to Nevada, it's legal. Gambling, right? Or casinos or, or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we, you know, we can get caught up in, in all kind of things, you know. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make a connection of... Uh, of uh, idols with that with that explanation so you're saying think so you're talking about things that are legal but not necessarily of God so that's right that, right that's right, right, right. Thing, th things things that society says that is legal but it might not necessarily be of God oh right and, 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 and so and so just like even even us in the church living in this world, you know, you know, we can say, well, it's okay for me to do that. You know, it's legal, but mm. it might not necessarily be of God. I, I guess my point is, you know, we can get caught up in the legalistic 
things, right? Well, yeah, the legalist. So yeah, so there's yeah. there's the things that the world the world is okay with that we should be against, and then the second point is there are things that the religion is okay with that may not even be okay. There are things that because like that's when Jesus came, he said your traditions have ma have made the word of God you know, of no avail. So that the traditions, the traditions that they had in the church were going against the word of God. So we can develop traditions in the church that are actually against the word of God or against God's will. But they become normal. So what about they become so normal. So what about the cross? What about the cross? Is the cross not considered an yeah, that's uh, that's what we talked about last time. So that one's, so that one is uh, yeah. So that one is sort of yes and no. So the difference is it's not, it's an image of something that's man-made. So it's not an image of something that God made. It's not an image of something. So it's it's a it's a replica of something that you know. It's like if if there's a chair and we make a replica of a chair. So if you're worshiping the cross, then that's wrong. But if you have, if you have a, yeah, so I don't know, that's debatable, kind of. If, if you're worshiping, if you're praying to the cross, then that would be wrong. You know, well, but, yeah. but I will play devil's but, advocate. Okay. I will play devil's advocate. Okay, so uh, what constitutes worship? Is it, is it just praying? It doesn't necessarily mean just praying. It's praying would be if, if you're esteeming it higher than you. So if you're raising it to a position of this worth worship, so you're raising it into an esteemed position. So if someone is praying to Mary, I'm saying Mary is higher than me as you know, me as a human at this time, this statue of Mary or there or what Mary represents something that's higher than what I am. So I'm going to right. honor that. So if you're honoring this cross or honoring the statue versus you're honoring Jesus, then that's then that then it's an idol. You know, but if your honor and you're praying to Jesus and your honor is going to Jesus, then that isn't necessarily idolatry. Also, too, you know, it's just like you can go to some churches and they have a picture of their pastor. Mm. You know, their pastors up on the wall, and people, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, you, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, this is Reverend so and so, Reverend X, and his wife, Reverend, you know, and people, you know, and the name on the placards and. So that, that, that's what I mean by kind of like, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a, a tricky line. You yeah, know? yeah. We, we, we can get so, so spiritual that, 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 that we is, are afraid to do anything, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't go off on a tantrum, you know, yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to go off, off subject. And I was just saying, you know, we have to. Sorry. That, that was all I was trying to say. All right, so All let's right, uh, let's continue. Let's continue. Well, so so God's voice. So the the so God's voice. How do we? <clears throat> so for review, we looked at how to determine if a message is from God. How to determine if if it is God's voice. And the first thing we said: Does it agree with the Bible? So that's the main main criteria: is Does it agree with the Bible? So how do we know what God is going to say unless we know what He already said? How do we know what God? is going to speak unless we know what he has already spoken. So does it agree with the Bible? If it clearly disagrees with what the Bible says, then it's not from God. It's not of God. The second thing we looked at is uh, that you can get counsel from wise Christians. If you want clarity on if something is from God, you can get counsel from wise Christians. Ask the opinion of other Christians. Also, if you want clarity on if it's from God, you can get God uses other people to confirm his word. So it may be a pastor, or Bible teacher, or fellow Christian, or a prophet can uh, speak to you and can, can give you clarity on whether it's God's word. So maybe you'll go to church and you'll hear a sermon that, that, that clarifies something you were thinking about. 
The next thing you could do is you can ask God himself for clarification. You can ask God for clarification on the issue if you're not clear, if you're still not clear if it was God. We said that you can see, does it align with the previous word God gave you? So if God gave you a clear word before, then does it align with that? Or if it aligns with that or if it contradicts with that, then you may want to question it and, and continue to investigate it. Then we looked at the fact, does it align with your purpose? So does it align, if you, if you, if you know your purpose, your God-given purpose, and you have a plan or a thought, you want to look, does it align with that? You know, then we talked about the fact that there's a difference between a purpose and a season. <clears throat> so you may have an assignment for a season, and those can change, but you may, you may have a final purpose that is either clear or not clear at the time. And so if it, if it contradicts with your purpose, if you know you're supposed to be a missionary in Uganda, then you might not want to take a job in Cupertino that you have to be at every day. Um, another sign that it could be from God is do things effortlessly fall into place? So do things just fall into place? It could be a sign is from God. You know, it's not necessarily a sign from God, and it's not necessarily always the case, and it is probably the exception, but that could be a sign is from God. And then the uh, last thing we talked about was that was heartburn. We looked at the example when Jesus was on the road talking to them, and after he left and they found out it was Jesus, they said, didn't our hearts burn when he spoke to us? So when you hear a word or when you hear something, it's just you feel something. It ignites something inside of you as a sign that it could be from God. So those are the ones that we spoke of before, the eight previously, and we're going to speak to two more today. We're going to speak to two more of them today. Uh, let's see. So any thoughts on those that we've looked at already? I can just say, just to familiarize yourself more, uh, Deuteronomy speaks highly about the law and, uh, and the, you know, why the laws and, and the commandments and the two. So, guys, when I dive deeper into that, look into Deuteronomy. All right, all right. I think we've we've dug into that enough. I think, but uh, that's what I'm saying. Oh, you're all. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the. Uh, so the next one is, the next thing to determine if it's from God is, does it bring you peace? Does it bring you peace? So I read Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. So the be anxious for nothing, the peace of God. So the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. So the word peace in the Hebrew is a familiar word, shalom, which means completeness, soundness, welfare, or peace. In Philippians, this is the, uh, the Greek word. So the Greek word is irene, irene. For peace, it means peace, peace of mind, invocation of peace. So it's a common Jewish farewell. So peace. And so the peace, there's a, there's a worldly concept of peace. And then there's a spiritual concept of peace. So the world, does someone have, who has a John Angel? You have John 14, 27? Yes. Uh, this is from the... Translation, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Right, so the peace of Jesus is different from the peace of the world. So the peace of the world, when the world talks about peace, they're talking about the absence of trouble. So peace of the world is being free of conflict. When you talk about peace of the world, it means having no stress. It means being free of anxiety. And it's a, so basically the world version of peace is a kind of a temporary escape from this troublesome world, this troublesome existence. There's a historian that described peace as the lull in the battle when everyone stops to reload. 
So the world's view of peace is that there's going to be trouble and chaos, but every now and then, all your conflict, all your stress and everything is gone. You have these little periods of time when there is no stress, a little period of time when there is no chaos. And it reminds me of uh, when I growing up, there was a commercial. There was a lady, it was a mother, and her kids were yelling at her, and she's trying to make dinner, and you know her husband is is yelling at her and different things are happening and she goes into the bathroom and shuts the door and she says Calgon take me away and she sets the bubble bath and 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 then she's and just has a smile on her face and so the what they're trying to convey is that oh if you buy this this bath soap then you know once you get into the tub you know there's going to be peace so there's going to be a period of peace while you're in the bathroom once you go out the door all chaos is going to break back loose but, you know, there's a period when you can be at peace. So that's kind of worldly peace. It's like there's a period of time when the, all the stress, when all everything goes away. And so in, world, in the world we pursue peace, you pursue peace with distractions, with recreation, or maybe watching football or basketball, or people pursue peace with drugs, a temporary escape. They pursue it with shopping or going to get a massage or maybe even with yoga or meditation. And so that's a natural peace. That's a natural peace. It's a natural peace that, that we get. So that's kind of... Distractions. It's a distraction or it's a, yeah, it's a distraction from stress or it's to relieve you from stress. Yeah, distraction. So that's kind of a, a natural peace. So that's not the peace that surpasses understanding. So that peace is easy, it's easily understood. You know, that doesn't surpass understanding. We understand that because it's, you know, you're released from your stress. There's no stress. That's, that's natural. That's understand. And so secondly, though, peace is not, that we're not talking about the peace that you get when you get what you want. So we're not talking about the peace that you get when you get what you want. So say, you know, you're looking for a job, you're, you're, you're unemployed, you're trying to find a job. And then you get you get a job offer. Same, your cousin had the same job, and at one time she took you to Paris, and her company paid for everything, and and you got the same job. They want you to be an international tester, an international taste tester, and so your job is once three times a month you have to go to a restaurant. You know you could choose it. It could be a mom and pop restaurant, and you go eat for a couple hours, and you give feedback to the chef. You know you could choose a little mom and pop restaurants. You could go to Paris to Africa to Peru you can choose where you want to go in the world just three days a month you have to go to a restaurant try the food they're gonna pay all your trip whatever you need if you want to take some friends they'll pay for your friends the salary is a million dollars a month you know you can stay as long as you want you know and, and when they offer you that job if you get a piece that's not a piece that surpasses understanding you know that's easily understood that's something you want so when you get a piece from something you want it that's not the supernatural peace we're talking about. You know, the so super. There's a difference between contentment, being content, please. Uh, well, content, yeah. Peace is um, kind of being free from worry, from anxiety, from stress, and contentment is sort of being satisfied with with um your situation so there there so contentment can bring you peace so i guess peace is a state of is a, they're both states of mind so they're they're similar they're similar i think when you so, in the scripture it's talking about peace beyond understanding mm -hmm. i think that applies to when uh there is chaos, and you're in the middle of it, and it's like, how can you be at peace with all this going on around you? It's like the world's falling apart. You know, family members, family members, I don't know. Or even just one family member, and it just seems like, you know, you're really upset, and then there's a peace that comes over you and it's not always understood why you had especially from the outside and sometimes you yourself why you 
at peace with it. Mm. So I think that's the piece of what's being referred to in the scripture. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. So who has a, oh, Patrice, you have 2 Thessalonians 3.16? Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. Right, in every way. And mine says in every circumstance. So it's, yeah, so giving you peace at all times. So a supernatural peace is, is yes, yeah, like you said, it's supernatural peace is more when you, get, there's a peace when you don't get what you want. So a peace when the, when the chaos hasn't stopped, when things are still going bad, that's a supernatural peace. It's, it's not the peace that you get when everything goes your way. It's peace, you know, I talked about the example when I was, you know, stressing and anxious when I was looking for a job. And then at some point, God said, stop looking. And then all of a sudden, I was at peace. I wasn't stressed. I wasn't anxious. So that was a sign that it was from God. It's like, although my problems didn't go away, although the stress and everything was still there, I was at peace. So my problem didn't get fixed. I didn't get what I wanted, but yet the word, the word from God gave me peace. So that's a sign that is from God. It's a, a supernatural peace is a peace that's not based on your circumstances. It's not based on what's happening. So a natural peace is based on things outside of you. It's things based outside of you, your circumstances, your situation, where supernatural peace is based on is not based on things outside of you. It's a thing based inside of you. And we, uh, we talked about in the lesson of the three Hebrew boys, we talked about a concept of fireproof faith. Fireproof faith, you know, the three Hebrew boys, they, they put them in the fire, and yet they still didn't doubt God. And, and they, they, they said, we know that God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we still won't bow down. So God didn't deliver them from the fire. So he said, sometimes God will deliver you from the fire, and sometimes he'll make you fireproof. So sometimes God will deliver you from the fire. Other times he'll make you fireproof. So fireproof faith is, is when God doesn't remove the circumstances, but he gives you a peace, or he allows you to get through it in a, in a supernatural way. He gives you a calm. He gives you a contentment to get you through it, so the storm, when the storm doesn't go away, when the solution isn't presented, when you don't get healed, but yet you get through it, and God, you get through it in a supernatural way, that's a fireproof faith, and that's, that's a sign that it was God. So when a, when a word comes to you and it gives you a supernatural peace, that's a sign that it might be from God. And it and it doesn't. We don't always get peace, so it's so it's not a hundred percent sign. Just because it was from God doesn't mean you're going to have peace. So that's kind of one of the things I hear people saying that oh, if you'll have peace if it's from God. So it doesn't have to. You don't have to get peace. You know, Jonah, when God told him to go preach to Nineveh, he didn't get peace. When God told the Israelites to go to Canaan, they didn't get peace. When God told Hezekiah he was going to die, he was not at peace. He, he, lost, <laughs> he lost his mind. You know, when Samuel told Saul he was going to be king, he went and hid. He, was, he didn't have peace. When Nathan told David his child was going to die, he didn't have peace. So it's not a 100% sign that you're going to get peace. Just because it's from God, it doesn't mean you'll have peace. But if you get peace, that could be a sign that it's from God. And but uh, and it, and so sometimes people abuse that that the concept of peace, of getting peace. You know, if a, a guy came to me, he's like, oh well, he's like, hey, you know, talking about him moving somewhere. I was like, oh, you guys moved? And he says, yeah, my well, my um, my 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 wife, she's been nagging me all the time and complaining because I wouldn't get a job, I wouldn't get a job, and. And, I, and, and she, she came home and she saw me on video games and she got upset and, you know, the kids were yelling. And so she's always complaining and always nagging. The kids always complaining. And, and then she accused me of cheating. 
and you know because I was cheating and but he said but what I decided is my my girlfriend wants me to to move in with her so I'm so I've moved in with her and she doesn't nag and complain and she doesn't mind me playing video games and now I'm at peace now I have a peace you know so I feel God wanted me to move there because I'm at peace now it's like well no that was <laughs> so just just because you're at peace doesn't mean it was God. That's a natural, you know. That's a natural peace, you know. So some people try to use the peace as an excuse to to blame God for something they want to do. But it so it's 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 not a hundred percent sign, but it but it is a sign from God. Somebody have a let's see, who has Acts twenty four twenty four to twenty five? I do. Okay. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Thank you. All right, Acts 24, 24. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who is Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. So Paul started telling Felix about, about righteousness, about self-control, and he told him about there's a future judgment. A judgment is going to come, and you know non-believers are going to be judged. And Felix got afraid. He got afraid, so he was definitely not at peace. So the, 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 does the fact that he wasn't at peace mean that God wasn't at work? Or mean that the message Paul gave him wasn't from God? State your question again. Oh, so the Felix, when Paul told him about, he was teaching him about Christ. He was teaching about righteousness, being righteous. He was teaching about self-control. And he was teaching him about a future judgment that's going to come. You know, a judgment that's going to come to people who don't accept Christ. And Felix got afraid when he heard about this judgment. So Felix wasn't a Christian. So he got afraid. So does the fact that he didn't have a peace mean that, that, that the message wasn't from God, the message Paul gave him? Or why was Felix afraid? because he knew that Paul was was right you know conscious or conscious has a way or guilt mm. as a way of uh, convicting us right yeah exactly so he was convicted so he was convicted of it and so that's the the final way so that God can talk to us through the Holy Spirit is that it can be through conviction so Lorraine, you have John 16, 7 to 11? Yes. Oh. You said, what was it? 16, 7 yeah. to 11? Yes. Right. Okay. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes... He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father. And you will see, see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. All right. So the Holy Spirit, they say he convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So in there, Jesus told them that it's to their advantage if he goes away. Because if he doesn't go away, he won't send the Holy Spirit. So why is it to their advantage that the Holy Spirit be there versus Jesus? And so one of the reasons is that Jesus, when Jesus was on the boat with the disciples, he wasn't in the field with the workers and he wasn't in the palace with the king you know when he was in the garden of Gethsemane he wasn't 
on the road to Emmaus. You know, he, he was only in one spot at one time, whereas the Holy Spirit can be everywhere. The Holy Spirit can be everywhere at the same time. So, so that, that was one reason it would be advantageous. And so, but we see the Holy Spirit, he speaks through conviction. So the Holy Spirit, so conviction is one of the ways that God can speak to us. You know, for example, a lot oftentimes in some churches you'll get, you'll get the, you know, the hell sermon about, oh, if, you know, if you, you know, you need to accept Christ today and, you know, don't wait, come down front. Don't wait because if you, you, you leave here, you might get hit by a car. You never know. You never know if you'll make it back next Sunday. And, and that will turn a lot of people to come. Some, you know, people will join because they, they, they got convicted during the sermon. So conviction. So it, it's conviction. Conviction versus condemnation. So condemnation is what the enemy uses. Condemnation, whereas conviction is something that moves you towards Jesus, moves you towards the right path, where condemnation just moves you towards feeling guiltful or shameful. You know, so if someone, you know, hasn't been to church in a long time and they start feeling convicted, they start feeling convicted that that's conviction of the Holy Spirit. Conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, so yeah, so the Holy Spirit can convict you. And when you go to, when you go to court, when you go to court, if you've been found guilty, then the judge will convict you. So to convict you, the judge, it means that you're guilty. It means that you're guilty of something. And I, I saw this TV show once was interesting that there was a man, he was in a bar. He was in a bar and he was sort of talking to somebody and it kind of got into a little bit of conflict, just changed some words. And he got up, he pulls out a gun and he just shoots the man. And then he goes and sits back on his seat. And everybody's just shocked. And the guy, so the bartender calls the police and the guy just sits there. Eventually the police come, the police come and they take him away and he's, you know, talking smack to the police. Then they take him to the station and he, and he says, well, I won't be here long. And they're like, no, we're going to put you underneath the jail. You're going to be here forever. And then, and then a half hour later, you know, people come in in suits with, with walkie talkies and everything. And they go and they, where's the captain? We need to talk to the captain. They get the captain. And then the next thing you know, the captain's coming back. I can't believe this. You know, this is wrong. And the captain lets him out and they take the guy away. They take the guy and they, and they, they leave with the guy. You know, the, the police have to let him go. So it turns out this guy was in the witness protection program. So he was going to be on trial for a big mob case. And he was going to testify against one of the top mob bosses. So he was under witness protection. And he was kind of abusing, abusing the witness protection program. But they needed him to testify on his trial because they wanted to put this guy away. And so he basically, he didn't get to, he didn't have to serve the time. And that's kind of the same how we were with Jesus. So we were found guilty of our different sins. We were found guilty and we were convicted. So the Holy Spirit will convict us, tell us we're guilty of the sins and we are convicted of it and we're guilty. But in the same way, we don't have to pay the penalty for it though. So Jesus paid the penalty for it. And so we've, we don't have to pay the penalty, even though, so Jesus set us free. Jesus paid the penalty for us. So we've been set free. So hopefully we won't abuse that freedom like the man did, but we've been set free. And those are the, the ways that God talks to us. The way that God talks to us. So he talks to us through, does the Bible agree with it? Or a way to discern or to test if a message is from God. Does it agree with what the Bible says? You get counsel from wise Christians. God uses other people to confirm his word. You can ask God for confirmation. Does, does it align with the previous word from God? Does it align with your purpose? Do things effortlessly fall into place? Does it bring you peace? Or did it, you get convicted by the Holy Spirit? So those are the ways... God speaks to us. Walk in the way, let's seek the truth and live the life. Uh, any ways most common that God speaks to you? Or that you've got confirmation that a word was from God? Um, me, uh, confirmation.
information usually comes through like um, through either like the Sunday school lesson <laughs> or like it will like I'll be sitting the Sunday school lesson I was like wait a minute like you know it's like right on point mm. either you know hearing the word from church I'm like was he in my conversation like <laughs> <laughs> you know like the preacher is preaching I'm yeah. like wait a minute like like um for instance, there was a song that was on my mind, mm. and then I get to church, and it's crazy. He sings the song, and it's not a common song. Mm. So it, 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 it happens, like, you know, sometimes it is a small, still voice. Sometimes I have that, like, it's rare, but, yeah, that happens. And then um, just how things work out, like, that too so mm. um those are the, the few ways okay so usually it comes through the word mm. okay well those are good anybody else oh actually the question i sent out i forgot was uh has there been a time when you got peace when you got a word Mm. People call and ask me how I'm doing, and I'm like, I'm at peace. I'm, I'm just observing and watching what God is doing. It's really kind of amazing things that are taking place. So, uh, yeah, I'm at peace with that. I, I'm not eager to go out and do the things that I used to enjoy. Mm. Yeah, peace. Supernatural peace. Anybody else have any ways they got supernatural peace? Situation, better situation than you were before. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So yeah, now I'm able to come to the Bible studies and have a job, and so that's wonderful too. So.